Today we tell the story of one of the first labor uprisings in the coal industry in Anderson County, Tennessee in the early 1890s, a conflict that's known as the Coal Creek War. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and this is Stories, A History of Appalachia. Now if you like our stories and you want to see and hear more, be sure to click that subscribe button down below and share our videos with your friends. Thumbs up would be most appreciated as well. Steve, this is, ironically, altogether, the first salvo, I guess, ever fired in one of the first labor uprisings ever in the coal industry. And this kind of set the stage for what we know of things later on down the line. But we're going to talk about the beginnings of it today with this Coal Creek War. That's right. You know, most people don't think of Tennessee as being a coal area, although right. it certainly was back in the 1880s and 1890s. Actually, all the way down toward Chattanooga, as you'll hear in this uh, right. podcast. Mm -hmm. Well, Anderson County is in East Tennessee, on the very eastern fringe of the Cumberland Mountains. And Coal Creek is a tributary of the Clinch River. And in its course through the mountains, it slices a narrow valley between Walden Ridge on the east and Val Mountain on the west. The creek cuts through Walden Ridge at a water gap overlooked by a hill called Militia Hill. And it was here, Rod, that anger between the miners and the mine owners boiled over into outright armed conflict. And the seeds of that conflict came about shortly after the Civil War, when Tennessee, like many other southern states, began leasing out convict labor to businesses as a way of generating income during the Depression years of Reconstruction. That, along with the coming of the railroads, opened up the coal fields in and around the newly formed town of Coal Creek to major mining operations. By the way, Rod, you know what Coal Creek's name is now, don't you? Uh, no, not right offhand, I don't. Rocky Top. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. They, they changed the name here several years ago. I think they officially changed it to Rocky Top, but I had forgot about that. I did not know that until now, yeah. again, I've been reminded. Yeah. Well, in 1871, the state of Tennessee leased convicts to the Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railway Company, or TCI, which was the owner of a huge coal and coke operation in the Cumberland Plateau, west of Chattanooga. They then, in turn, subleased those convicts to smaller mining companies, such as the Knoxville Iron Company, which had a mine at Coal Creek, and the Cumberland Coal Company, which owned the Big Mountain Mine, at Oliver Springs, also in Anderson County. And the miners who were working for those companies were not at all happy with those arrangements. No, Steve, they weren't, because things started to get worse on the election in 1890 of several candidates of the Tennessee Farmers Alliance, a labor-friendly post-Civil War political party. Among those winning office was Governor-elect John P. Buchanan. This election led to the miners at Coal Creek to make demands on the mine owners, one of which was to be paid in cash instead of that all-famous script. Now, they also wanted to be allowed to use their own men to weigh the coal each miner dug out of the ground, which would determine how much each man got paid instead of those hired by the company. Now, I can remember this being talked to me about from my dad and also from other people in the family of, yeah, they weighed it, and they wanted to find out how much coal you had in there as opposed to how much slate was in there. So that was always a big deal, and if they felt like they were being cheated, they didn't pay you as top dollar on that particular car that came out of the mine to uh, that you were going to get your money. Well, ironically, Tennessee law barred the payment of scrip and used the company-hired check weighman from what those specialists were called anyway so those demands should have been a non-issue at that time. But even though most of the mine operators agreed to the miners' demands, the Tennessee Coal Mining Company, which operated a mine near Bryceville, flatly refused to agree and shut its operations down on April 1, 1891. In June, the company demanded that its miners sign a contract agreeing to those illegal practices before they could return to work which the miners refused to do. So, on July 5th, TCMC reopened the Bryceville mine using convict labor, negating the need to comply with Tennessee law on weighing the coal or paying in cash. 
Not only that, the company went ahead and tore down miners' houses in Bryceville and replaced them with a stockade for the convicts. And buddy boy, that did it, as far as the miners were concerned. On July 14th, there was a meeting of local miners, along with the town's merchants, who were understandably concerned about the effect of, well, basically, no miners' paychecks, and right. no miners' paychecks, no miners' spending, and no money for the businesses. So they got together to plan a course of action. And rumors were rampant, including one that said that an even larger contingent of convicts was on the way and would be there on the 15th. So that night, a group of armed miners, around 300 of them, surrounded the Bryceville Stockade, overpowered the guards who surrendered without a fight. I guess they figured out that would probably be the best course of action for them, as angry as those guys were. They then marched the convicts onto a train in Coal Creek and sent them on their way back to Knoxville and prison. Uh, They also sent a telegram to Governor Buchanan defending their actions, asking for him to send the authorities to help them out. And what happened, Rod? Well, Governor Buchanan read the telegram. We don't know what his reaction was, if he got mad or what, but on July 16th, this labor-friendly member of the Tennessee Farmers Alliance promptly called out the state militia, three companies worth, and accompanied them to Knoxville. Well, I guess we got our answer there, what he did, where the convicts were loaded back on the train and then shipped back up to Bryceville to be put back to work in the mines. Well, word of this betrayal, as it was called, got out to the mine workers, and several of them showed up at the Thistle Switch train stop to confront the governor and also demand that he address them. And in his address, which was pure political hemming and hawing, you know, trying to save face, Buchanan told the workers that while he supported labor and had to enforce Tennessee law and then pleaded for patience, which frankly was in short supply by this time. Knights of Labor organizer Frank Morrell was there. He responded to the governor calling the state government, quote, a disgrace to a civilized country, end quote, and that the governor should at least enforce the laws about Scrip and Chuck Wayman. And later that night, the first shots of the war were fired when, well, shots were fired at the convict stockade where the governor was spending the night. The next day, probably wisely, Governor Buchanan left, leaving 107 militiamen to guard the stockade, under the command of Colonel Granville Severe, who, by the way, was the great-grandson of famous Tennessee and John Severe. Well, things escalated, and on July 20th, Steve, when 2,000 miners, armed with rifles, shotguns, and handguns, again surrounded the stockade at Bryceville. Now, these included the miners from Bryceville, along with miners from Jellicoe and also from Kentucky. Severe, who was heavily outnumbered, got assurance that the company property wouldn't be damaged, and then promptly surrendered. Well, once again, the miners marched the convicts out to the train station, put them on the train once again, and then shipped them off to Knoxville. And later that day, the miners marched on the Knoxville Iron Company mine near Coal Creek and did the same thing with the convicts that company had been working alongside of its miners. And Steve, I know, I was about to make a joke. I was going to say, How many times did they march these convicts back on the train and send them back into Knoxville? More times than Tennessee Volunteers offense has been successful in the last couple of years. But I digress. I shouldn't have said that. (laughs) No, you shouldn't have said that. But (laughs) despite my intense support for Tennessee, you're probably right. (laughs) Okay. All right. I did want to point out something, though, in this. You notice... These miners could have just opened a stockade and said, get, right, and let them all loose. They didn't do that. They kept them under guard and put them back on the train to make sure they didn't escape, kept them in the jail. So that's yeah. you know, a plus for the miners there. Well, anyway, the next day, Governor Buchanan again left Nashville and came to Knoxville along with the militia. This time, he took the time to meet with representatives of the miners, attorney J.C.J. J. Williams, Knoxville Journal editor William Rule, and an organizer from the United Mine Workers, a man named William Webb. 
On July 23rd, Williams and Webb addressed the miners at Coal Creek, asking for their patience while they worked on getting them relief, assuring them that the governor supported an end to the use of convict labor. With that assurance, the miners agreed to a 60-day truce to give the governor a chance to call the legislature into special session with the goal of repealing the convict lease law. And he did just that, didn't he, Rod? Yes, he did, because Governor Buchanan called that special session to meet on August 31st. The session was adjourned on September 21st. Wow, talk about staying in office and trying to get something done, with only the accomplishment being of passing a law, making it a felony to interfere with the leasing system and authorizing the governor to take any necessary action to protect the system. Well, with that, the only hope for the miners was a case that was working its way through the courts, ending up before the Tennessee Supreme Court in October, which resulted in a ruling against the miners. On October 28th, the committee of Williams, Rule, and Webb resigned their positions and indirectly urged the miners to take up arms. And that call was heard loud and clear. On October 31st, armed miners burned the stockade at Bryceville and seized the stockade at Coal Creek. Over 300 convicts were freed and given civilian clothes and food and told not to commit any more crimes. Then, on November 2nd, the stockade at Oliver Springs was burned to the ground and another 153 convicts were set free by the miners. At this, Steve, another truce was reached allowing the return of more convicts to Coal Creek and Oliver Springs, but not Bryceful, mainly because TCMC President B.A. Jenkins had had enough of all this convict labor. The state sent the militia to guard the compounds at Coal Creek and Oliver Springs and built Fort Anderson on Militia Hill, overlooking the Walden Ridge water gap of Coal Creek, and also, not to be outdone, setting up a Gatling gun up there to keep the peace. The convicts returned on January 31st, 1892, and it seemed like peace had finally come at last, but that turned out to be false hope, didn't it, Steve? Oh, it did indeed. But you know what I said a few minutes ago about making sure they were guarded and put on the train? Right. Yeah, that all got thrown out. But notice what they did. You got to, I'm going to let you go, but you better promise me you're not going to commit any more crimes. Oh, sure, boss. No problem. Yeah. I I guess they were just pretty much done with it, don't you? Was this a script maybe later on for the Andy Griffith show? I don't know. Or, you know, <laughs> but still, it's like one of these, you better be- behave yourselves if you're going to get out there and you're going to go to work, behave. That's kind mm. of, you know, kind of far reaching, expecting something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked about false hope just a second ago. Mm-hmm. You see, Tennessee Coal and Iron, the big mining company east of Chattanooga, which was the main user of convict labor, bought out those operations at Oliver Springs and began using convicts in a big way, getting rid of most of their employees to make room for the leased inmates. And that sat no better with the miners than it did with the Tennessee Coal Mining Company the previous spring. On August 13th and 15th, 1892, miners' unrest against TCI mines in Grundy and Marion counties spread back to Anderson County, where on August 17th, A group of miners led by John Hatmaker attacked the TCI compound at Oliver Springs, eventually causing the guards to surrender. The stockade was, yes, burned to the ground, and the convicts put on a train and shipped directly to Nashville, never mind Knoxville. On the 18th, militia commander Keller Anderson, who built Fort Anderson, for whom the fort is named, was captured by the miners at Coal Creek. The men then charged the fort and killed two militiamen but failed to capture it. Well, at this, Steve, Governor Buchanan sent in 583 militiamen to restore order. He also ordered the formation of posses by sheriffs in Anderson and surrounding counties to assist. Most of those sheriffs simply ignored the governor, though, including the sheriffs of Anderson and Morgan counties. But a group of volunteers from Knoxville marched in to relieve Fort Anderson but were ambushed by the miners, resulting in the deaths of two of them, with the rest fleeing for their lives back to Clinton. Upon the arrival of the militia, the release of Anderson was secured and order was restored. 
hundreds of minors were arrested and placed in detention at the Bryceville Community Church. Well, other than a failed attack on the TCI stockade at Tracy City in April 1893 and the hanging of a miner by the militia for killing a soldier in a brawl, the war was largely over at this point. Governor Buchanan, who had vacillated between the miners and the mine operators, was abandoned by both of them and lost his bid for re-election in 1892. Ironically, the cost of paying for the militia to keep the peace and allow the convict labor system to be used was more than the financial benefits from the contracts. So Tennessee allowed the contracts to expire, then ended the system by building Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary and buying land in Morgan County for the convicts to mine coal directly for the state instead of competing with free labor. And the miners who were arrested? Well, out of nearly 300 minor indicted for various crimes during the Coal Creek War, only one, D.B. Monroe, got any real jail time, being sentenced to seven years in jail. And Coal Creek? That's gone by many names, including Lake City, but as we said at the beginning of the podcast, it's now known as Rocky Top, Tennessee. You know, so many of these things that took place, situations may have been different, the years were different, but sounds like a classic union, you know, non-union corporate uprising is what it sounded like more than anything else. Because, you know, you mentioned here at the end of it, D.B. Monroe got any real jail time out of it. You know, I think back on the Pittston strike back in the late 80s into the early 90s. You know, really, there were some men that didn't even get any jail time out of it. They were accused of things, but nothing really stuck to them. I guess the only time that they really got stuck was when they were brought to that courthouse in Clintwood, and they all started shimmying down the chains on the outside of the windows going outside the courthouse. So that may have been their only real punishment they got out of it, you know, ripping their hands open by going down those chains of the uh, uh, the apparatus to open the windows up. But yeah, this sounds like just one of those classic minor operator uh, coal deals where one doesn't do what the other wants them to do and vice versa. And they go back and forth until either somebody loses a life or you know whatever, or an agreement is made. Well, this is basically a forerunner of the West Virginia mine wars, which would yes. happen about 10 to 15 years later and continue on up until 1921. Um, violence, I mean, it, it, when people get to where they feel they have no hope, right. they're going to do whatever they need to do. And it's obvious with this, that's what happened. These miners took things into their own hands. They released all those prisoners, what, a half a dozen times. Yeah. And, um, they kept bringing them back in there and their so-called buddy, Governor Buchanan turned out to be a backstabber and cost him his political career, which yeah, not a bad well, thing. No. Well, you know, this reminds me, too, of the documentary. I've watched it before, Harlan County, USA. I've watched mm-hmm. that documentary, and I have been simply just drawn in and enthralled with that entire video documentary of what happened down there during the 70s with their uh, Cold War that they had down there against, you know, the company bringing in, quote, unquote, scabs and non-union people to run the mines. And I've seen that before, and I've watched that, and then I think of all these other labor uprisings and things like this. You know, it's it's just something that goes on. It's like you said, when people have something that they can get upset about and they can get angry, you know, you got to watch out. Things are going to happen, and that's what happened in this case in the Cold Creek War. Yes, indeed. And, folks, that's the story of the Cold Creek War, another part of the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for watching. You can subscribe to the audio version of the Stories Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or on your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to know a little bit more history, well, you can follow us on Facebook at Stories Appalachia or Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Again, thanks for listening. Until next we meet, y'all take care. So long, everybody. So long. 